Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to talk about death and dying. Not in a morbid way, but actually to help many of us who are curious about it to find some peace of mind separating fact from fiction. I'm Risa Morimoto, your host, and you're watching Modern Aging, where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to care for one another as we age. If you want to stay in the loop about all our latest videos, click on that subscribe button and that little bell so you're sure to always be notified when new episodes are uploaded. Today's guest is Dr. Chris Kirk. He's Chief Medical Officer and CEO of Hospice Buffalo. He's interviewed thousands of patients over the years about their experiences as they approach the end of their lives. You can check out his TED Talk on YouTube. Just type in Christopher Kerr, I See Dead People. We had an awesome conversation about the process of dying, separating what is common myth to what is actual fact. Check it out. You know, when we first talked, or when I first saw your TED Talk, I was very excited to talk to you. Today we're going to talk about um, the process of dying. Um, but before we kind of get to that, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and your background, how you came to become a hospice doctor. Sure. Okay. I'm um, born and raised in Toronto, uh, Canada. A I'm nice still Canadian. Canadian. Uh-huh. Uh, came down for a beer in the early 80s and ended up staying. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and met somebody and so I've been here ever since and I live close to the Canadian border in a small town called East Aurora near Buffalo. And I live on a horse farm. Wow. Um, I got to hospice completely by accident. I trained, did my residency at Strong in Internal Medicine and then um, uh, I came to Buffalo for cardiology and I needed to moonlight to support my family and one day I'm looking through the one ads and saw an ad for a hospice doctor. And I had, funny because I had petitioned to actually get out of the rotation as a resident. I didn't think there was anything to learn or do. Wow. So I went there um, just looking to do some weekend work to supplement my income. And uh, that's how it happened. And I started working there and I just was immediately taken um, by how much there was to do. Right. I know. Well, and I'm curious uh, actually. How much, like what do you do as a hospice doctor? You know, you're really <laughs> looking after the totality of the patient. So uh, from complex symptom issues uh, to psychological distress, you're caring for their practical needs, you're caring for them in the context of their family. Um, the best way to describe it is other specialties of medicine tend to be organ focused. Right. And we're focused on the larger experience of illness. Uh, anything that's affecting quality of life. So it's heavily predicated on a lot of communication, open, honest, transparent communication. So that includes prognostication, what to expect, things that may be absent upstream in the care of the patient. Um, so it's all of that. Wow. So you must develop kind of close relations with some of these patients, no? I mean, and what's kind you of do. the normal span of time that they're there? Well, unfortunately, there's a subset of patients, probably a third they're in for a week or less. And then the rest may be there for several months. But you, you do get very close um, because you, you, you get to see them as people, not just patients. You're, you know, you're caring for them in their home. You're caring for them in the context of their relationships, their existential issues. So you, um, so you do health calls? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, wow. I'm sorry. Yeah, the most of hospice is home-based care. Oh, okay. So I thought you were <coughs> in an institution. I thought you were in an actual, like... Hospice. No, we have a dedicated unit, a freestanding unit where people come who are in distress or can't be cared for in their home. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of patients, 90 plus 95 percent of our patients we care for where they are. Right. Yeah. And I think, I feel like... Most people don't want to die in a hospital. Right. Well, for yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing though. So um, are you also there at the last moments? Often, yep. Mm -hmm. And so, so what actually happens as, like, when do you know that death is imminent? At what point? It's, it's really notable for how atraumatic it is mm -hmm. um, it, or anticlimactic it is. Uh, you know, dying is really a process. It's, it, it doesn't occur in, in minutes. It usually occurs in, in months. There's 10% of deaths are acute. The rest are essentially forecastable. Um, and the common denominator for all of them is a lessening. You know, you eat less, you do less, you sleep more. And that's the trajectory. We tend to think of it, you know, illness in terms of parts, but this is more constitutional dying. And if you think of old people, 
you know, who've died. You know, one month they stop going to get their mail, the next month they stop going upstairs, they start napping more, they eat less. Um, the body has ways of telling itself that we're dwindling. And that's what dying really is. It's a dwindle, it's a slowing down. Um, and you sleep more comfortably. So there's less to do than you would think. We tend to complicate dying. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, an early illness, it's, you know, if you take something like cancer, where you are in the disease is determined by, you know, the size or the spread. And so we get very focused on quantifying illness right. in, in terms of measurables. You know, what are blood counts? Um, what's the size of the tumor? That sort of thing. But actually, that becomes less of the issue. So we see people who are dying even as tumors are regressing. Because, oh, really? wow. oh, yeah, because it's not really the issue. It's the burden of disease over time. Mm -hmm. So if you had the flu for three days, you'd feel one way. The flu symptoms could be less, but if you had the flu, those symptoms for 30 days, you would feel dramatically different. So right. it's, it's, it's that weight of illness. It's the, it's, it's the cost on the body. Um, and what it, it gradually, it doesn't pay to do. It pays to do less, to eat less. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the common denominator is progressive sleep. Unless something's interfering with that process. Something being, you know, a pain or a bad cough or breathlessness. So a symptom. Otherwise, it's actually, a, there's a built-in mechanism for dying that it's innate. Um, Do you think that people know when they're dying? Yes. Yes. That's the great the jokes on us um, you know I, I even know doctors who you know don't want to um, tell a patient that they're dying because they equate that with giving up or taking away hope right which is absurd right um, first of all what? It, yeah. it, it's the patient's life and their body um, uh, in an age of autonomy and self-determination if anything you should have the right to reclaim what's happening with your life um, but unfortunately that actually happens people keep that uh, from patients. Um, I've never met one that didn't know they were dying. Uh, even in dementia, uh, it's shocking how people have an awareness. I mean, if it's you're lying in bed and it's, you can't get up anymore, you look at your arm and it's half the size it was, you know, um, you have a way of self-informing mm -hmm. um, that defies medicine's best attempt to deny dying. Um, so right. the tension comes when there's an incongruity. And you see it all the time, um, where patients are aware, uh, yet medicine's telling them something else. In terms of the actual physical process, right? So once they're in hospice, yeah, do they get pulled off all their meds? Is it no, just not at all. Pain? No, there's there's a lot of myths with hospice. Um, first of all, physical pain is way overstated. It's 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 less. Oh, it is. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Far and away. Uh, I would say confusional states, psychogenic distress, um, the consequences of impairing sleep uh, or changing sleep architecture. Uh, people start, as people start to transition, those become more prominent. Pain is much less of the issue. Right, that's the fear, right? Yeah, and that's, one of the, that's a symptom of, of what's wrong in the care of sick people, is that people go into it completely uninformed um, as to what to expect next. I often tell the story that people will go to their cancer hospital and know where to park, how much the coffee is, right. but they actually don't know how they're going to die, let yeah. alone when they're going to die. Is that just because the doctor doesn't tell them or they don't ask or is there just like this weird uh, like... Yeah, th there's a couple of symptoms. Sometimes it's hard for patients to hear it, so there are doctors who are fully disclosing. Um, I think that Medicine is set up to be so interventional, even the economics of medicine don't really recognize the dying patient. They recognize the patients we do things to. Um, so wow, so, right. If you think about it. So you don't, you don't go to the hospital because you're feeling sick and are dying. You go there be, because something is being done to you. Right. Uh, even if it's just an imaging. Um, so that's where we recognize the patient, so we, we're heavily focused, obviously, on the treatment, not the relief of suffering. And um, so the dying patient almost falls off the assembly line of, in, of care in our modern healthcare system. 
and um, because the primary doctor has a much different role now, um, they're kind of they f often fade into the backdrop as subspecialty medicine takes over. Right. But if you don't have a reason to go back to the doctor, you're often left, uh, and you're left with these great questions: Where am I at? What's going to happen to me? Uh, and that's where the fear comes in. Yeah, and you know we have a medical culture that's death-defying. Um, yeah, why? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. I think that um, as medicines have evolved and there's more to do, we've become self-enamored um, mm -hmm. with technology and the skills that we can bring to bear uh, to fight illness. Um, but we've got more and more focused on organs uh, and not the big picture. Right. Um, I think there's an assumption that somebody else is telling the patient you know, what's actually happening. And there's some data that's really interesting. The more doctors involved, the less the patient actually knows. Um, oh, interesting. Well, because yeah. you got a bunch yeah. of spot welders. <laughs> right. You know, I'm coming, I, I'm the kidney guy. You know, I, don't, I don't know what's going on with this. The heart. You know, I'm, the here, heart. I'm here for your heart. I don't know what's going on. So it's very possible to be getting world-class care, multi-million dollar care, be within a unit or something, and the family not actually know what's transpiring. Right. So there is a gross absence of, uh, of honest communication um, about what's happening. And if you think about it, if, if your means of communicating with your doctor is because you're being evaluated or something's being done to you, when there's no longer anything to do, which is the worst words in, you can say in medicine, there's nothing more we can yeah. do for you, that's when you literally go home and your, your, your family and you are left with what happens next. And unfortunately, we're in a healthcare uh, environment where l there's very little dollars towards care at home. So yeah, when you need so care most, right. you receive the least amount. Um, so yeah, it's tragic. So in terms of the actual physical process of dying, like the steps, yeah. how do you advise families and how do you advise patients? I don't know if it's the same in terms of expectations. Yes. So basically, their doctor, they're, they've been in the hospital, their yeah. doctor who now says, we can't do anything else. Right. So then they get transferred to hospice. Right. And that's where you step in. Yep. Right. I think the starting point typically, um, because there's an abundance of misinformation or a lack of information or disparate pieces of information, the first thing you have to do is find out what they actually know. Mm -hmm. And it's often striking. So you'll see somebody who's literally days from death who doesn't know that they're actually dying that soon. Um, so there's, you know, the over-prognostication is by a factor of two to three on average. So, really? yeah. So resetting things often first requires determining what somebody understands. And then really what do they want to know? And what you find is people want to know. Mm -hmm. Um, again, because they've been having these di this dialogue with themselves, uh, often it's incongruent to what they're hearing from the medical practitioner. Uh, so yeah, so you kind of reset the table. And they should expect to, that it's fine um, for them to sleep more, don't bother them. You know, like what do you, yeah. what do you tell a family, like what to expect in terms of the actual process, just make sure. You know, you I know feel like I, once we're in the hospital, we're so trained uh, to be like, make sure you turn them over, make sure they're not getting bed sores, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think what you do typically is, is, is you, you go with them and, and repaint the picture. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 I, I could do this with you with somebody you've lost, for example. You know, before they died, and if we were to talk and say, you know, what were they like six months ago? What were they like four months ago, two months ago today? Um, it's seldom a falling off the cliff phenomena, it's a slow slide. Mm -hmm. That slope or that trajectory is the same one that's going to take them to the end. They've often been in the process I of see. dying, but nobody's informed them. It, it, it's functional, it's practical, it's eating, it's sleeping, it's activity level, um, it's talking less, uh, it's, it's being different. And once you can, can recontextualize what somebody's experienced, and then they can usually understand what's going, just going to continue in the same tra trajectory. Do you bring in social workers on that Yeah, sort of thing? so hospice was brilliantly framed in that it was, was a number of things. It was really an antithesis of the medical 
bottle. So it's mandated volunteer, mandated spiritual care, social work, nursing, um, you know, the physicians there, but they're, they're part, they really truly are part of a team. I find that within treatment, there's a lot of times like a cultural gap. You know, for example, like my family's Japanese, right? Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to figure out to have aides and doctors and stuff to understand her cultural background, how she likes to be treated, how she likes to eat, how she likes, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like all these different things that are subtle yet important, yeah. um, especially when one's sick. So I'm just wondering at the end of life, is that taken into account or is there kind of like kind of a standard thing that happens? Yeah, I, I, no, it's, it's, it's not templated at all. Mm -hmm. um, again, imagine your, your, your mom or your father now is taken care of in their home and you're present. It can't help but become personalized and specific to that individual. It's very, very much about your choices um, and your perspectives. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you've come out of a sterile, institutionalized form of care, right, and process to really, we're, we're coming to you. We're meeting you where you are, um, psychologically, spiritually, in terms of your wishes, all those sorts of things. I feel like the fear of death is probably one of the number one things, right, that people it creates anxiety for them. What do you say to patients who are fearful of Yeah, that again, happening? it's it's remarkable for the fact that it's really less more anticlimactic than climatic. It's quieter, it's gentler, it's more peaceful. Um, it requires less uh, intervention than you would think. It, it, you've essentially been doing it, you know, you, on your own and and, and well. Um, it's a lessening and it's, it's more peaceful than imagined. Um, and you just go describe it. I, again, it goes to this issue. In the absence of conversations, in the absence of knowledge, people presume fears. You've already done it. You made an assumption about pain. That it's right. going to be, if, you know, if I told you you were dying, that's probably the first thing is, am I going to suffer? So people need to be reassured what dying looks like. It's actually hard to die in a sufferable state because you need to sleep. And to sleep, you need to be comfortable. And you need to be comfortable not only physically, but psychologically. So gradually that comes over you. And people generally die peacefully. Okay. I would do a whole thing on hospice. I would start with looking at the myth. So people live longer with hospice, you don't live shorter. Um, you know, you don't deny care if you have heart failure. The way you manage symptoms of heart failure at the end of life is by managing the heart failure. So it's not a lesser care model. In fact, it's a richer care model. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, oh, you flicked a switch and now you're in hospice, you stop all your medications. Right, no, that's what I did think. I mean, you stop the absurdities, you know, right. like cholesterol lowering medicines, you know, that are meant to treat end organ disease over many years, you know, but you manage diabetes, it doesn't feel good to have a high blood sugar. So, mm -hmm. you know, all the things that make you feel more comfortable um, need to be kept in place. So it's, it's actually ag uh, aggressive medicine. Yeah. It's not passive medicine. Yeah. But does that physically fight with the body that's trying to die? No, not at all. Mm -mm. No. Oh, no. interesting. Yeah. You know, people talk about these last moments, right? You, that hearing is the last to go, mm -hmm. that you see a light. No. no do, you know, there's like these no, kind of... No, the light thing's bullshit. <laughs> 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 The, the, you're confusing near death um, um, for end of life experience. So the near death phenomena is universally. I've never s seen it because th that's folks who clinically die and come back. Right. The, the universal experience apparently is that you see a white light in a tunnel and all that sort of things. That's not what happens. <laughs> that's not what happens. To, no. No. No sparkly clouds. No. Or like... No. And there's all sorts of things like they they say that you know the uh, occipital lobe of your brain being deoxygenated and you know there's a medical explanation or physical explanation for why that may or may not be occurring. People who are genuinely dying and not coming back. Um, from it, don't experience the the tunnel white light thing. You know, we I think maybe the odd time I've heard of a light, but but not like you do. That's what NDAs are, near death experiences are. Right. These folks aren't near death; they're dying. dying. Yeah. Right. But they do say that the hearing yeah. is the last thing to go, and that oh, people should talk to people 
really at their last moments if they feel Yeah, like. and you know, it's one of the things is, is dying people don't want to be treated like dying people. They want to be treated like the people they were in life. So um, sometimes the most comfortable deaths, you know, like if they're a kitchen family where everyone hangs around and it's vibrant and a lot of open communication, that's how they like their room. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, they don't, n nobody wants to be treated like they're frail and need to be put on a shelf. Um, you know, there are people who certainly uh, are uncomfortable, you know, that matriarchal person doesn't want to be seen in her nightgown. You know, maybe that's different. But generally, people want to be treated, they, it becomes really a profoundly a human experience. And they don't want to be sterilized, they don't want to be put on a shelf, they don't want to be treated as though something is, makes them less. Mm. Um, so they want to be touched, they want to be talked to, they want to be regarded, um, yeah, and they hear. We would love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to leave a comment in the section below. If you found the video helpful, share it with a friend or family. And be sure to subscribe so you'll always be notified as soon as new episodes are uploaded. You can DM me on Instagram or Facebook at This Is Modern Aging. But the best way to keep in the loop about our latest episodes and our upcoming events is to sign up on our email list at thisismodernaging.com. To live your best life tomorrow, you need to start today. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Modern Aging.